Okay, so today we're going to look at pseudocode and trace tables. I'm going to pause on this slide, give you a chance to have a look at this code and see if you can spot an error. If you look through this code, you'll notice the green block where we're making reference to num1, num2 around the middle, just here. We're saying here that num1 is less than num2. So if number one is less than number two, print num1 is larger. Now this is incorrect. This is what we would refer to as a logical error. We're uh, using the wrong logical operator. We should have this symbol in the middle the other way around. So suggesting that if num1 is greater than number two, and this is just an example of one mistake that can happen in an algorithm. And we'll look at how we can identify these in today's lesson. So specification content. So some of this stuff builds upon the work that we've been looking at in previous lessons. So identifying the inputs, processes, and outputs for a problem, some structure diagrams, create, interpret, correct, complete, and refine algorithms using pseudocode, flowcharts, reference language, and trace tables. Today's focus is mainly going to be around pseudocode, reference languages, and trace tables. I'll pause on the requirements and give you a chance to read through them so that if you uh, wish to do so, you can. So let's first look at what pseudocode is. Now, pseudocode is a way of planning programs in a way that will help and assist us when it comes to actually writing our code. And there's a few things to consider within pseudocode um, to kind of gain a full understanding. Now, firstly, pseudocode isn't a programming language. So what that means is that there isn't a, such a way that you have to write it that uh, means that it has to be exact every time, it has to be the same every time. So what we mean by that is you can write in almost a hybrid programming come English language, um, and we'll look at some examples of this. One of the key things though is that it is a structured way of writing. Now what we mean by that is that with your programs that you create on the computer, there is a sequence in which they uh, execute, um, and equally you want to kind of use indentation and so forth to show where there are dependencies on lines, loops and so forth happening. And again, I'll highlight this to you when we look at some examples. But pseudocode will generally appear as a hybrid between, as I say, the English language and a programming language. And there's lots and lots of ways to write pseudocode, and we'll explore some of those over this session. So the first thing I want to introduce is these three sort of key sort of terms, and you may hear this over the course of your study. Now, this is relevant for the OCR J277 specification, but it may well be relevant for others as well. So the three key terms, natural English. Now, what we mean by natural English is the language that I'm speaking now, the language I would write in and that you would use generally speaking at school or in your everyday environment, where we're using full sentences and paragraphs and just generally full words and, and what we speak and use naturally. Whereas pseudocode is different. Pseudocode is structured English. And I mentioned previously that structured English where we have some organization and a flow and sequence to um, our, our text. You might write it in bullet points and it's generally more succinct. So for example, if you were asking if their age is over 15 or if they're over 15 years old, then for example, they can come in and watch this film. You'll be more succinct than that. So you might say if age is greater than 15, but you might not say is greater than, you might use the uh, logical symbol for that. It's inherently formal, uh, informal. So it isn't a case necessarily that you're writing any sort of formal manner. I know it kind of sounds almost obvious. Um, syntactically loose, what we mean by that is the fact that it isn't tied to a specific programming language. So it isn't a case that you have to consider, have you remembered uh, colons or exclamation marks or brackets and those sorts of things necessarily. They won't necessarily be crucial to your understanding of your code. And this is where we're saying it's open to interpretation. Now, open to interpretation means that if you've laid your pseudocode out in a structured and organized format, that actually, as long as the person who's using that pseudocode can understand it and read it and see the flow of that program, they'll be able to create an application or program from that. So it might well be a, a scenario where, for example, you've used a variable name age, you put a capital A in one place and a lowercase a in the other. It's not gonna change the function and the logical flow of that program. And someone picking up that pseudocode would probably recognize that there is kind of just a mistake there. Now, obviously, we don't want to kind of encourage those mistakes and we want to kind of, generally speaking, keep some, some consistency within our variable naming, but just as an example where it can be interpreted. So exam reference language then. Exam reference language is um, specific to the OCR qualification. And these are where some kind of more structure in terms of the language in the sort of punctuation marks and so forth that are used. And this is partly to make it clearer to you as students 
what exactly is being asked. And you'll see as some examples of this as well. Um, it looks a lot more like a programming language than it does English. But if you were to copy and paste it straight into something, say, for example, like Python, you would find that it wouldn't actually execute. So let's have a look at some examples. All we've got here is a flowchart on the left hand side and then the equivalent pseudocode. And you can see there's some broad similarities. So at the flowchart, we've got our start point and we've got our end point, as we always do. We've got our input hours, input rate, and then the process of calculating our pay. So pay equals hours times rate. And in our pseudocode example, you can see that we've used begin and end. Now, you don't always need to use begin and end, but you may wish to do so to make it really explicitly clear where your pseudocode starts and finishes. You've then got the statements inside. So input hours, input rate, pay equals hours times rate, print pay. And the idea is that if you wanted someone to create this program, they could take that pseudocode and program it in a number of languages and it would have the functionality that you've planned. So it's very, very similar. In essence, if you look at this scenario, you can see that effectively you're just taking away the shapes and the text that is left behind is ultimately your pseudocode. And it might be in some circumstances that's kind of a supporting way for you to understand how pseudocode can be written. Another example is here. On the left hand side, we have a flowchart. Now, this flowchart has a loop in it. Now, this loop is ultimately just counting up to five. Now, you can see in the pseudocode examples that there are a number of different ways of doing this. You can have multiple solutions to the same problem, just as you can when you're programming. If you think about how in your class, when you're coding something, you might have very different code to the person next to you. However, they'll still get the same output as you. You'll still solve the problem. So quite often there can be more than one way to solve a problem. And just keep that in mind. It's the same with pseudocode. You may write your pseudocode slightly differently, but ultimately it will solve the problem as long as it logically makes sense. So reference language, I touched on this already. Now reference language is a term used by OCR. They refer to it as OCR reference language. And that's largely because there's no strict rules with pseudocode. So what they've done is to kind of almost give some rules to keep it standardized so that when you're studying, when you're doing your exam papers, it's all consistent and enables you to kind of have a firmer understanding as to how things will look. And I'll show you some examples of what OCR provide us with. Now, with this being said, as I mentioned, it does look a lot more like a coding language. And again, you can write your answers in the exams in this OCR reference language or in a pseudocode variant. And either way will be absolutely fine. Students in the past have generally found it quite easy to try and stick towards the reference language just purely because it's uh, sort of closeness to Python. Um, meaning that they're probably stand a, a more reasonable chance of getting things correct. So here are some examples. We have the output statement. So print hello. And if you copy and pasted that directly into Python, then yeah, you, you would be able to execute that and that would run and it would print hello on screen. So that in itself is syntactically correct, as is the input. So input, you've got your declaration of your variable. So num is the variable name equals, and then input, enter a number. And again, as I mentioned, if you copy and paste that into Python, it would work. Selection on the other hand is not syntactically correct. So what we mean by that is you couldn't copy and paste this. However, if you look at it and our experience with Python, you may recognize that there's very much some similarities there. But you can see if num equals equals two, so we're saying if the number, the variable number is equal to the number two, then move on to the next statement and so forth. So again, you can see the format of how this text is written. And again, some examples here for for loops and while loops. And it may be that you come back to this in the future and it will make um, more sense as you sort of build your confidence with Python programming. So here's an example of a reference language al uh, algorithm. Now, don't worry about the fact that there are some uh, issues with this algorithm. That's not a problem. And part of what we're doing today is looking at these algorithms and identifying problems. But this is an example where if you said age is the variable, input your age, so if you put in 15, for example, if the age is greater than 13, you're a teenager. If your age is greater than 16, you can go to work. If your age is greater than 18, you can vote. Else print, you have no restrictions. <clears throat> now, in the example where if we put in the age 15, you would have printed, you're a teenager. If it was a case that we put, for example, 17, you would have, you can go to work. Equally, if you put 16, you'd have, you can go to work would be printed. But also if you put 16 or 17, you would also have, it print that you're a teenager. So it would print both lines. 
Now here I'm just kind of introducing this logical sort of comparison here, this greater than or equal to uh, symbol. Now, again, as you grow with confidence using these more frequently, um, and as we sort of look at these in separate standalone lessons, these become almost second nature to you. But you can see an example that even if you aren't the most experienced programmer, you could probably make sense of what's happening with this program. It's fairly straightforward to follow. It's something that even just using plain English, you'd probably be able to see and understand and explain. Trace tables. Now, trace tables are used to keep track of data in our programs. And what we mean by that is our variables will change over the course of our programs running. And we can use a table to actually keep track of what's happening with our variables at any given time in our program. And this can be really useful when we're trying to identify problems in our program. So for example, if we've created a loop and the loop seems to be infinite going on forever, it might be that we can spot the point in which it fails. And we can use trace tables for any program that we're using variables in. And I'm gonna go through a couple of examples for you. Now, this is a simple trace table with just two variables. We've got a sequence of seven lines of code on the left-hand side, and we'll work through this line by line. So if we look at the table, uh, we've got our lines one through to seven on the left-hand side of the table, and then we've got our empty boxes for X and Y. So we're gonna go through executing this program as a dry run. So our trace table on line one, X equals zero. Now you'll notice that there's no value for Y because at this point in our program, Y has not been given any data. Line two executes and it sets Y to equal to zero. And you'll notice on this occasion that there's no value for X because on line two, X does nothing. Therefore, X remains as zero. As we move to line three, we have X equals X plus one. So X is currently zero, adding one to it increases it to one. And again, you'll notice there's no impact on Y and therefore at line three, we have no data to complete for Y. Line four, Y equals Y plus two. Well, Y is currently zero. When we add two to it, it becomes two. Line five, we have X equals X plus Y. So we're adding the values now of X and Y. And on our trace table, we can see that X is currently one, Y is currently two, and therefore X becomes three. As we move to line six, we have the same code again, X equals X plus Y. However, this time X is now three, Y is now two. So when we add them together, we have the X value being five. And on the final line, line seven, we have X equals Y minus X. Now Y is two, X is five. So we're doing two minus five and our X value is now minus three. And hopefully you can see from that how we're keeping track of what our variables are doing at each point in our program. And this is the simplest form of trace tables. I'll show you another example, which is slightly more complex, although there's less code. So this tra trace table only has five lines of code, but you'll notice on line three that we've got a while loop, which means that some of our code will be repeated. So when we look on the table, you can see that our lines this time go one, two, three, four, three, four, three, four, three, five. You'll notice I've also included the gray column, which is my condition. Now your trace tables may not have that in in the future, but it's worthwhile kind of just for the demonstration of this uh, algorithm for you to be able to see what that condition is doing as our program runs. So again, as before, line one, we're setting X equal to zero. So in our first line, the only thing that we're doing is storing a value for X. Line two, similarly, the value for Y being set as zero. When we get to line three, this is where our logical comparison starts to take place. So line three, we're saying whilst X is not equal to three. So X is zero, which is not equal to three, therefore making that condition true. Line four, X equals X plus one. We're increasing our X value by one. We then go back to line three and we check X against three again. So is our value for X? So in this point one, is it not equal to three? Well, that's true, it's not equal to three. Therefore, it's true. We move again, X increases to two. We carry that same check. Is two not equal to three? True, two is not equal to three. We run line four again, and this time it's now three. Now, when we go back to line three this time, is three not equal to three? 
false. 3 is equal to 3. And therefore, our condition is now false, which breaks our loop and allows line 5 to run. Line 5 is saying y equals y plus x. Well, y is 0, x is 3, and when we add them together, we have our value of y being 3. And hopefully you can see that that's a bit more of a complex trace table that's probably about as complex as it will get at GCSE. But you can see how we can then obviously identify what's happening in our program and we can see the flow of our program and ho hopefully sort of identify any errors that might arise using our trace tables.